As I said, a funny thing happened to me this morning. Um, comrade jumped into a lift with me and said, what's your debate with Ian Birchall really about? <laughs> and I said, it's about the lessons of the German Revolution. No, 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 what's it really about? I said, the role of Paul Levy. No, what's it really about? I said, it's really about those two matters, which are really important. And he said, well, I didn't know anything about them. So I said, well, you could come, or perhaps you ought to go and sit in the corner of bookmarks for the rest of the day and just read Chris Harmon's chapter on the March Madness. I don't know whether he's here, whether he's done that. But I do insist that's what it's really about. Um, and it's an incredibly important subject for the one simple reason, arguably the single most important question from the 20th century, which is why did communism fail? And one of the reasons why it failed is the Socialist Revolution of October 1917 didn't spread to the advanced industrial countries as everyone expected and hoped and the single most likely country for it to spread was Germany and indeed there was the beginnings of a German revolution and I'll be touching on that in a few moments. That's why this is so important and should be taken very very seriously indeed. There's another difficulty which is 20 minutes each. Ian and I will be touching on kind of parts of the story which themselves deserve at least 20 minutes. So we're almost talking in headlines, and it's difficult to do, but there's no way around that, so I do I'll urge you to bear with us. And it's also inevitably going to be quite polemical, and I also ask you to bear with us for that reason, but I do regard this as an education above all else for all of us, and I'm very, very serious about that. Uh, Biff and Harmon left us a fantastically important legacy about this subject, but we shouldn't theologise that legacy. We shouldn't, shouldn't say because they've, they've both produced really innovative work on it, that's the end of the matter. Far from it. Marxism and living science, and there's constantly new research, and we need to deepen our understanding of this subject. I also want to make a couple of points about Ian, because I'm Johnny Come Langley, this has been a passion for him all his life. Uh, but he's always been extremely helpful, often emailed him questions which he might have thought irritating and possibly critical of his own position. He's all responded immediately with new information, arguing for sometimes supporting a point of view I might have that he doesn't have. I also, in one sense, this is an argument about Paul Levy, who of course, people hopefully you do know, took over the leadership of what became the German Communist Party after Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. Um, and it is partly about that, but I'm going to argue that it's not just about Paul Levy, it's that we can, but understanding Levy allows us to touch on some of the absolutely important themes of the German Revolution, why it failed. I want to begin with a passage from Ian's article criticising what I and Sebastian Zettemar from Germany wrote in the issue that the chair referred to, and Ian wrote this. Paul Levy was a man of penetrating intelligence and personal courage. He did not aspire to the leadership of the German Communist Party, but was thrust into it by the murder of Luxembourg and Liebknecht. And Paul Pierre Brouet also adds that Levy really didn't want to do it, and Karl Radek said, you'll be shot if you don't do it. Um, Levy's promotion of the United Front strategy rights in was of great value, and I'll come back to that. It was not surprising that Levy felt betrayed by those he had regarded as his comrades. This is a very important point. 90 years on, writes Ian, there is no point in taking sides. Very important. I hope everyone remembers that. But we can learn lessons from Levy's life. Alongside his merits, Levy had one serious weakness, quite apart from a notorious lack of tact and arrogant attitudes, a fierce hatred of ultra-leftism, and he didn't know how to handle ultra-lefts. And I agree with all of that. I'm going to touch on some of those things. Um, one argument, I'll just flag this up to begin with, where Ian and I will disagree, is whether there was what's called a cover-up at the Third Congress of the Comintern. I will come back to that. But that's only one part of the story. Now, one of the difficulties here is we do assume some knowledge of the German Revolution. And in particular, you can't really begin to understand this discussion unless you're familiar with the first four months, roughly from November, December, October, November, December, January, 1918, 1919. Those are the four, in one sense, the four most important months of the German Revolution. If you stretch it to 1923, those four months are decisively important. Why? Because you saw, just as the war was coming to an end, the flowering of workers' and soldiers' councils. A fantastically exciting development, and seemed at the beginning to confirm the best expectations of the Bolsheviks and all those supporters around the world, because indeed it did look momentarily as though the revolution was spreading. The socialist revolution from Russia was really going to spread to Germany. And here were the Soviets, in all but name, in, in Germany, in workers and soldiers. A magnificent achievement, but, and there's a really big but, it's such a big but it undermines everything I've just said. And the big but is 
that within the, and the reason why it's only four months is that within those four months, there was the beginnings of revolutionary organisation, but there was a very, very sophisticated, what had become a reformist, to a large degree pro-war party, the German Socialist Party, the German Social Democratic Party, very effectively organised, and they organised in every conceivable way to undermine the workers' and soldiers' councils, and they were very successful. They were so successful, just to give one example, their supporters were able to block Luxembourg and Leibniz appearing at the, the Berlin Executive of the, of the Workers and Soldiers Councils in December 1918. And what they achieved, from their point of view, was to completely undermine the Workers and Soldiers Councils and to make the Constituent Assembly, the German Parliament, the authority. In other words, fitting exactly with the reformist perspective, which at the same time undermined the revolution. Now, the backgrounds, that background is essential. Um, now, Paul Levy enters, from the point of this discussion, enters the argument about this point, December 1918. I say that the revolutionary organisation was it, simply incapable of competing with the reformists, the Spartacists of Luxembourg and Leibniz. There was an attempt to form a German Communist Party in December, late December 1918, and it's a measure of the respect that Paul Levy was held by Luxembourg and Leibniz, he led the argument against what all three regarded as the ultra-lefts in the German Communist Party, excellent street fighters that they'd been, very committed revolution that they'd been, but one thing they totally opposed was participation in the German Parliament. This was a really bitter debate, Luxembourg and Leibniz were for it, Levy led this discussion, but the vote was lost. And I can't get over strongly enough how important this was. A measure of its importance was many of those shop stewards I've referred to, who had become revolutionary socialists, did want to identify with the communists, were ready to join with Luxembourg and Liebenich in a united communist party, refused to do so. And one of the reasons they refused to do so is the ultra-left victory of a not participating in the German parliament they cited as a major reason. They gave other reasons as well, that was the most important reason that they gave. It's just worth dwelling on why both Lenin and Luxembourg regard this as so important. In a sense, I've already said it. Because the parliamentarians had won the argument, it seemed, amongst the German public as a whole, then it was essential, argued Lenin and Luxembourg, actually made very similar speeches at different times about this, that you had to be inside Parliament to undermine it from within. Not just about using Parliament as a platform for revolutionary socialist ideas, but to find different ways of, 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 of as I've just said, undermining it. But that argument was lost. The vote was lost and it went down. And it was particularly tragic because Luxembourg predicted that there would be a bitter strike wave in the first few months of 1919, which there was, and the expectation had been that a German Communist Party could intervene and grow very rapidly and begin to redirect the upsurge from below. But tragically, it simply wasn't large enough because the failure to bring it together and that didn't happen. So that was the, and the point, I, I just want to stress the point I'm making about this, that that we're lo looking at Paul Levy's ultra-leftism, it isn't something about his makeup. it's about the way in which really key events in the revolution kind of intensified the attitudes that he had. This, that was the first one, of course. The greatest tragedy of the failure of the German Communist Party was, of course, the state execution of Luxembourg and Leibniz. But there's another event in January that in many ways is just as important, which is sometimes called the January of Spartacus Uprising. There was a huge upsurge, more than a demonstration. I mean, something, I suppose, similar to the kind of events we've seen in Egypt over the last uh, a, a, few, a few weeks. Mainly concentrated in Berlin, but of revolutionary proportions. And there was a sense amongst not just non-workers, but many, many workers who took part in the January Uprising of 1919, that here was an opportunity to take power. And it's something similar, if you're familiar with the history, of the July days in 1917. And posing the similar kind of problem. You've got a massive upheaval of workers and their supporters in hundreds of thousands, if not millions, but not by any means sufficient to literally take power. Leibniz thought you could and fell out with Luxembourg very publicly. At the same time, um, Radek and Levy were saying there should be a retreat, and there should have been a retreat, but it, the retreat posed a problem in terms of if you retreat, you're going to leave the kind of people who you've led into this demonstration in the first place, you're going to leave them behind. And it's a, it's, it's a terribly complicated and tragic picture that develops. Chris Harmon described it very, very well. Just, oh my goodness, described it very, very well in his book, The Lost Revolution. And it was a further measure of the fact that it wasn't, unlike the Bolsheviks, who could, who could get a, an orderly retreat in the July days, 
get an orderly retreat in the <coughs> July days in a way that was simply not possible in January 1919. And these two events certainly seared into maybe his consciousness a sense in which ultra-leftism is so damaging. And incidentally, Lenin's famous pamphlet about left-wing communism is in part based on these events. Now, I'm already halfway through the 20 minutes, I'm really going to have to go to headlines. Two really important events, many, but two I wanted to touch on, literally in terms of headlines, two conferences. The Heidelberg Conference of 1919. The Heidelberg Conference is notorious about Levy because this is where he expels the ultra-lefts. And is rightly criticised by him, criticised by Lenin. Chris Harman criticises him. But, in, but the important thing, in Chris's criticism of Levy, he's not denying that the ultra left has become a real problem, but he suggests different tactics to try to keep them in the organisation in the, in the short term and perhaps argue with them on a, on a branch by branch basis, hoping that they will leave. Because definitely they, 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 they were regarded as essentially sabotaging the way they wanted to move forward. An idea of that is going to the next famous conference, the Halle Conference running side by side with all of the events I've been describing is the continuing importance of the independent Social Democratic Party led by Kautsky and Hilferding. And Kautsky is an incredibly significant figure, as I'm sure most people who know anything about this subject will, will know. Kautsky, of course, had been the most important figure for Marxism as a whole. Lenin and Trotsky re uh, uh, respected him enormously before the turn of the 20th century. Kautsky, of course, then became, with his support for the war, not just a reformist, but a pro-war politician. OK, they pulled out uh, to some degree when they split the German Social Democratic Party and formed the independent Social Democrats, but he became notorious, Lenin quite rightly described him as a renegade Kautsky, anticipating before the Workers and Soldiers Council that Kautsky would be the leading propagandist against any formation of Soviets in Germany. And this, this, this party, nevertheless, organised hundreds of thousands of workers. And both the Comintern and Levy were very interested in pursuing a split in this party, which they did do. They split the party, and many of the 300,000 workers, I think, joined the German Communist Party. And as Bruro describes, for the first time since the Comintern was founded, a mass communist party now existed in, 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 in Germany, where revolutionaries, all, which, which revolutionaries all regarded as the pivotal point of world revolution. Another point about Levy, which Ian acknowledges, is that Levy was one of the principal authors of the United Front strategy. As a matter of fact, it was the Stuttgart workers. But now they had this really enormous base, what they call the open letter strategy, we're all very familiar with, where uh, 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 re re revolutionary workers and their supporters appeal to the leaders of the reformist trade unions with a set of demands to mobilize, not, not that they anticipate winning the leaders of the unions, but to mobilize the members of those unions in different forms of struggle, with a view both to winning those struggles and those demands, but also moving more workers into a revolutionary position. And that had enormous potential until we come, and would have, with untested potential, because we then come to the notorious March action. Now again, I'm really conscious of the time, this is in terms of headlines. And one of the most important headlines is what I call, not what I call, which was the theory of the offensive. They did, and I haven't got time at all to get into this, but it's so important. Part of the Comintern, of the Communist International, especially Bukharin and Zinoviev, have developed a kind of an insane vanguardist theory of revolution. That somehow the vanguard itself, by the vanguard, I don't mean the vanguard of the party, I mean the minority of advanced politically conscious workers could themselves start a revolution without the mass base. This is essentially the theory of the offensive. Slightly oversimplified, I'll do in terms of the speed at which I've got to go through this. It was a complete disaster. It was applied in the split of the Italian Socialist Party, leading to Bordiga's Italian Communist Party being far smaller than it should have been, and leading to a complete failure to understand the importance of rising threat of Mussolini's fascists, a point that I do give in some detail in my article in the last ISJ. But it was also a disaster in terms of Germany, which led to the famous March action. And here's a description briefly of what, what, the, the, of what the March action led to. Um, for about two weeks, the party centre appealed to members to go on strike, procure weapons of railway bridges. It even issued t threats against workers who refused to join the struggle. Physical fights broke out between communists and other workers, unemployed versus employed workers. 180 were killed, 6,000 communists jailed, four sentenced to death, thousands of communists lost their jobs. The German Communist Party lost nearly two-thirds of its membership. It was a complete disaster. And Paul Levy, quite rightly, denounced it and wrote against it, wrote a pamphlet called Our Path Against Bushism. Now, Levy had already been driven out of the leadership of the German Communist Party because he'd intervened in the Italian Socialist Party's conference and opposed this application of the theory of the offensive. Um, and this, the pamphlet made him obviously far more unpopular, and this is where it gets complicated, this is where Ian and I certainly do have a disagreement, 
Um, I want to make two points about what this disagreement, or, or ways of dealing with disagreement. I was very surprised. Ian perfectly understandably, and to some extent justifiably, uh, criticises Tony Cliff in the chapter in Cliff's volume four, I think it is, where Cliff describes the, uh, the third congress of the Comintern as a cover-up. All of these issues were debated at the third congress, and um, Cliff never criticised Levy, but Chris Harmon did. I was very surprised that, that um, Ian didn't refer to Chris's chapter on this, and there's a particular page, and I think just a bottom, got time just to give us a, a little bit of a flavour of it, um, Lenin justified, Lenin defended uh, the criticism of Levy on the grounds that Levy's attacks on the March action uh, were bound to turn many good communists against him. Levy's wholly negative criticism, which indicated no sense of solidarity with the party and exacerbated comrades, more by its tone than its content, diverted attention from the most important aspects of the problem. A ruthless Criticism of the March action was necessary, said Lenin, but what did Levy accomplish? A cruel mangling of the party. He went over the top, Levy, uh, 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 and uh, Lenin is saying, kind of lost the focus from his own point of view. But Chris Harman writes this, and for me it's incredibly important. Chris Harman writes, this part was okay, but it was hardly satisfactory. For while Lenin was telling Zetkin, I do appreciate Levy, he's proved himself in, t in times of the worst persecution, Radek, who was the Comintern's representative, uh, uh, in Germany. One of the perpetrators, by the way, of the theory of the offensive was writing of Levy in the pages of the International's official organ describing Levy as an upper-class fly-by now and, and as a coward. Furthermore, the Bureau of the International was issuing statements over the signatures of Lenin and Trotsky, amongst others, to the effect that, quote, Levy is a traitor. It was an abominable lie to pretend that the Executive Committee or its representatives provoked the uprising. I mean, this is absolutely appalling. I mean, I actually think this is, this is proto-Stalinism, the, the behaviour of some of the ways the leaders of the Comintern dealt with this. But there is actually an even more impeccable source than Chris Harman on this subject. Um, there's one author, I want to quote to you, who writes about the Comintern and its decision as follows. The problem is that the final resolution at the Comintern discussing the March action and its failure, the problem is the final resolution did not make an unambiguous condemnation of the March action, but described it as a step forward. Um, the author of that is Ian Birchall, and it's in the, his reply to Sebastian and I, and I think, Ian, that is a cover-up. That's exactly what a cover-up is. In other words, the... Um, it wasn't as much action could not possibly be conceived of as a, as, as a way forward. It was a complete disaster. Ian will say the reason why this kind of muffling of what really happened uh, 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 by the Comintern took place was that Lenin and Trotsky were desperate to keep Zinoviev on board. And one of, Lenin, uh, one of Ian's rhetorical questions to Sebastian and I is, what, what choice did he have? Um, would you have kicked out Zinoviev? Now, um, I've got no idea whether I did. But what I do know is that Zinoviev's record after that is a complete disaster. After all, Zinoviev and Kamenev that sided with Stalin against Trotsky just one year later. Now, I'm coming to the end of my contribution here. Um, we, these are headlines. I'm very conscious of the fact that um, if you're not particularly familiar with some of the details of this history, this, is, this has gone far too fast to do it justice. I don't, I don't want to sum up a, ki a, a, a kind of pluses and negatives for Levy. I don't think that's the important thing at all. What I do want to say is that if we study this period carefully, we can begin to tease out why the German Revolution didn't spread. And as a matter of fact, one thing I will say in Levy's defence, that the fact he developed, because the revolutionary wave had receded, and that's what made the United Front strategy so important. Of course, both the third and the fourth Congress of the Comintern adopted, especially the fourth one, adopted as policy of the Bolsheviks the United Front strategy, a strategy which to this day remains absolutely decisive anywhere for revolutionary socialists to develop the sorts of uh, politics that they need to do so. Levy is the author of that and should be commended for doing so. Yes, this was a, his, his ultra-leftism was a, a fundamental weakness, but the tragedy is these examples of ultra-leftism help derail the prospects of, of expanding the socialist revolution to Germany. And it's in that sense we need to consider the importance of this discussion. I actually agree with a very substantial amount of what John has said, and I'm not going to uh, go over those points. Um, what I want to do is pick up on certain things which are perhaps matters of emphasis rather than strictly uh, yes-no questions. But I think there are a certain number of questions raised by this that, um, that John has not effectively dealt with. 
I want to start, before moving on to the specifics of Germany, just to say a few words about ultra-leftism. Because John is absolutely right to say ultra-leftism is a massive problem, and I think we have all encountered it in various forms. Uh, I always think, actually, there are two different breeds of uh, ultra-left. Uh, what one might call maliciously the moaners and the headbangers. The moaners are the ones who, um, who say, oh, we can't vote for Ken Livingstone because actually, do you remember what he did in 1978 or whatever? You know, people who actually demand such a high level of purity uh, that they never actually do anything. The other form, which actually in some ways uh, is preferable, the headbangers, are the people who insist on charging the police lines even though there's ten times as many of them than there are of us, and not only get themselves arrested, but get a lot of us arrested as well. <laughs> um, right, now, the, and that was the March Action form of, uh, uh, of ultra-leftism, which of course, uh, in that situation, was a thousand times more dangerous than anything we've had to put up with. Uh, you know, so in a sense I'm being, I'm slightly trivialising the argument. But you see, um, what I think one also has to say is that ultra-leftism is not just some facet of the Germanic character or whatever. Uh, ultra-leftism is an inevitability in any revolutionary situation and indeed in any situation of rising struggle. And that you have to understand what the roots of ultra-leftism are. Oh. First of all, there are two roots of ultra-leftism, I think. One is the fact that ultra-leftism occurs when you get large numbers of new people drawn into struggle um, who have very little experience, who have no experience of, uh, of years of defeat or isolation, and who actually overestimate the possibilities and overestimate the consciousness of those around them. So they think that the fact that they've seen through parliamentary democracy means everybody has seen through parliamentary democracy. Lenin's very good on this in left-wing communism. Uh, the other root of ultra-leftism, of course, is actually the rottenness of reformism. People become ultra-lefts precisely because the social democratic parties, the trade union bureaucracy and so on, aren't prepared to fight. And that is what leads people into ultra-left positions. Now, ultra-leftism has to be dealt with. The question is whether you deal with it in the way that Paul Levy dealt with it. And as John quotes me as saying, there's no point taking sides in a faction fight 90 years ago. You know, uh, we have uh, our own faction fights to take sides on. You know, don't worry about what happened 90 years ago. The question is um, to try and learn from this. And certainly there's no point rubbishing the character of, uh, of Paul Levy. Although it is worth noting that two people for whom I have the most enormous respect from this period, Victor Serge and Alfred Rosman, both took an instant dislike to, uh, to Paul Levy. He was not a warm, lovable human being. Now, there's no rule, actually, that revolutionaries have to be uh, warm, lovable human beings. Quite a lot of us aren't. Um, but actually, you know, he did not handle the situation well. First of all, the Heidelberg uh, Congress of the uh, German Communist Party uh, in late 1919, which uh, John refers to, in which something like half the membership were excluded. Now, there was a real problem. The real problem was you had ultra-lefts who were against Parliament, against working in the reformist trade unions. You were not going to be able to win over the very substantial ranks of the independent socialist party unless you could uh, shift the line on that, that question. And you didn't have an unlimited amount of time in which to do that. So I'm not suggesting that there is an easy answer to that question. Nonetheless, I think that uh, Levy did not handle that question well, that he lost a large chunk of his membership when perhaps, and, you know, John quotes Chris Harman, things could have been done better. And I just want to uh, quote from the uh, message that Lenin sent to Paul Levy immediately after the Heidelberg Congress, um, 
you know, because when one has the image of uh, Lenin as this terribly harsh man who, uh, you know, always got rid of his political opponents as quickly as he could, that's, you know, that may have been true of Lenin at certain points in his uh, life. It was not true of Lenin in the period uh, of the year or two after the Russian Revolution. This is Lenin's message to Levy. <coughs> My impression is that they are very gifted propagandists, inexperienced and young, like our own left communists of 1918. Given agreement on the basic issue for Soviet rule against bourgeois parliamentarism, unity, in my opinion, is possible and necessary, just as a split is necessary with the Kautskyites. If the split was inevitable, efforts should be made not to deepen it, but to approach the Executive Committee of the Third International for mediation and to make the lefts formulate their differences in theses and in a pamphlet. Um, so that... I think was Levy's first great mistake. I think if that split could have been handled differently, and I don't say I have a recipe for doing it, if that split could have been handled differently, the entire history might have been uh, somewhat different. Now, the second uh, question is the March action. And John quite rightly gives enormous attention to the March action. The March action was a disaster. There is absolutely no argument about the fact that the March action was a colossal disaster for the German Communist Party. Uh, it lost... Membership figures are actually quite tricky, but it would appear something uh, between a half and two-thirds of the membership were lost in the aftermath of the, uh, uh, of the March action. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important to understand how we characterise it. You see, uh, Levy wrote this pamphlet, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Levy wrote this pamphlet in which he describes the, um, the March action as the greatest Bakuninist putsch in history. Bakunin was a particularly crazy uh, anarchist of the late 19th century. Now, there was a woman called Sigrid Kochbaumgart who has written what is probably the most uh, thorough study of the, uh, of the March action and what it was like in different areas. And there was enormous unevenness between different parts of Germany. She estimates that the number of workers on strike was around 200,000 and then perhaps another 20,000 uh, youth unemployed and so on participated in demonstrations and the fighting that obviously ensued. So we're talking about over 200,000 workers involved. Now, that is not enough to bring down a government. We know that. You know, we could put 200,000 people on the uh, streets. David Cameron, unfortunately, would not resign. Um, but, on the other hand, 200,000 is a bit bigger than the Bakuninist putsch. You know, it is a substantial movement of workers. And I think... Uh, really Levy, in his analysis, doesn't take this sufficiently into account. A lot of those workers, you know, we talk about this great achievement of bringing in the workers from the independent uh, Socialist Party when they were, uh, after the big congress at uh, Halle in the autumn of 1920. It was many of those workers from the independent Socialist Party who wanted to see quick action, who actually were taking the initiative. The March action was not something simply imposed by the, uh, by the Comintern and by Zinoviev and Radek, not defending the role of Zinoviev and Radek, uh, but it wasn't simply them. There was a genuine desire for action, for quick action, on the part of uh, a section of the German working class, only a section, unfortunately, and John's quite right to compare it with the fine, yes, to compare it with the July days in 1917 in Russia. And of course, the problem was the Bolsheviks, because they had a well-rooted party, could handle the July days. The KPD, which had been in existence for a few months or more, uh, was not able to handle that situation. But the role of Paul, Paul Levy you know, also has to be, uh, to be looked at. Um, you see, it's interesting uh, that John says <coughs> Levy wrote a pamphlet and so on. 
It didn't actually mention that Levy's pamphlet was issued publicly. This is a situation in which death sentences are being uh, passed and which people are being rounded up and arrested. Levy went public on this. Now, um, you know, I wouldn't want to push uh, contemporary parallels too far, but this is, this is rather like going on to a blog. You know, yes. it is rather like making an immediate open public criticism. Yes. And that was... And that was... Uh, Which side are you on? <laughs> Let me finish a sentence, Sorry. you know. Uh, uh, you know. Now, you know, therefore the argument has to be... Of course there are times when people may feel uh, that, uh, you know, arguments have to be taken uh, into the public arena. And of course most of our arguments are taken... You know, the argument between... Uh, me and John in international socialism is actually available online to anyone in the world. Uh, and I've got a quote about this in a minute uh, uh, that may answer some of your points. Nonetheless, that was one of the reasons why Levy was particularly unpopular. What's more uh, serious, and I don't think I'm guilty of this particular one, um, is uh, Lenin's comment on Paul Levy. He says, Paul Levy's entirely negative criticism which lacked that feeling of oneness with the party and embittered the comrades rather more by its tone than by its content, diverted attention from the most important aspects of the problem. Um, and of course you have to remember, you know, this an international situation. Um, if we hear tomorrow that workers in, you know, 200,000 workers in Venezuela have confronted the police, I think our immediate reaction is to say, great, right on, comrades. You know, later on we might hear more evidence and say, well, actually, that appears to have been unwise. But internationally, as people learn from the March action, that it was uh, initially very popular. And what Lenin is saying is that Levy's whole style of approaching the thing was to look at it from outside, not to uh, look at it with, uh, with the kind of sympathy a member should show. Now, this, uh, uh, this cover-up. Uh, phrase which uh, John takes from Tony Cliff and uh, which I think he is unwise uh, to, uh, to take from that source. An enormous amount can be learned from uh, Cliff's writings. It's very penetrating on many aspects of the common term. I think it always needs to be read critically and always needs to be read with reference to, uh, uh, to later research from the, uh, the last 30, 40 years. Now, you're going to have to take my word on this because the minutes of the Third Congress are not yet available in English. John Riddell has edited them and they will be available very shortly, sometime in the next year, I believe. And uh, when that happens, uh, perhaps we can all have a uh, more informed discussion of the matter. At the moment, I'm going to refer to the, uh, the German minutes of the Third Congress. And now what these show, the Congress lasted 21 days. Five sessions over three days, with 21 hours of debate, devoted to Radek's report on tactics, to which this whole question of the theory of the offensive that John talks about uh, was uh, central. Clara Zetkin, who was a supporter of Levy, although she had uh, stayed within the party uh, framework, Clara Zetkin was allowed to speak for two full hours, um, giving a speech greeted with vigorous approval and applause in defence of, uh, 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 of Paul Levy. So, you know, it is not that this is something that was shoved aside. And it's not something that uh, Lenin, for example, um, uh, you know, kept his position secret on. Uh, one of the committee meetings prior to the Congress, um, Lenin commented about Bela Kun, the Hungarian communist leader, who'd been one of the inciters of the uh, March action. Uh, 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 Lenin made so many remarks in which he uh, related Bela Kun's uh, name to another word uh, of rather similar intonation, uh, that um, the minutes had to be doctored to have this removed again. Um, nonetheless, um, you know, uh, there was a very open public debate on it. And I just want to quote what Clara Zetkin uh, 
had to say in this debate because she was being accused by Radek and others by defending Levy of actually, Radek actually heckled her at one point and said you're lining up with the public prosecutor. Uh, you know, you're lining up with people who are uh, sending our comrades to jail. Zetkin said this, and I think these are words that uh, uh, deserve to be uh, uh, considered. She said, if we're prepared to accept as a criterion what our opponents make of the written or spoken utterances of us communists, then we should never write a line and never open our mouths, for our opponents will misrepresent everything. Um, you know, you can't win. Uh, you can't, you, uh, if you keep quiet, uh, you'll still be misrepresented. Now, what I think is extremely interesting, and what I would commend to all comrades, um, is the account of these events given by Clara Zetkin. Um, Clara Zetkin published a book uh, called Reminiscences of Lenin. It's quite surprising that it would actually ever got uh, published. It is available in full on the Marxist Internet Archive, just put uh, the name Clara Zetkin in there and then look for Reminiscences of Lenin. And she describes the conversations she had with, uh, uh, with Lenin over the whole Paul Levy affair, the way she tried to negotiate a settlement whereby Levy uh, would uh, sort of go into obscurity for a period, write a few pamphlets under a pseudonym, and then uh, they, would bring him, they would bring him back. Uh, after things had calmed down a bit. Uh, Levy refused this solution. Um, but this is, this is Lenin again, and this again I think is Lenin at his best. Lenin explaining, not a cover-up, but a compromise, a genuine compromise. If the tactics to be decided upon by the Congress are agreed upon as quickly as possible, and with no great friction, becoming the guiding principle for the activity of the communist parties, our dear leftists will go back not too mortified and not too embittered. We must also, and indeed first and before all, consider the feelings of the real revolutionary workers, both within and outside the party. Well, we shan't deal roughly with the leftists. We shall put some balm on their wounds instead. Then they will soon be working happily and energetically with you in carrying out the policy of the Third Congress of our International. For that means rallying large sections of workers to your policy, mobilising them under communist leadership, and bringing them into the struggle against the bourgeoisie and for the seizure of power. Um, I think that is, uh, you know, genuine uh, leadership. And I think, you know, the final point that uh, John referred to, uh, the question of should Lenin have forced a confrontation with Zinoviev? Now, Zinoviev was a nasty piece of work, uh, and Zinoviev was guilty of a whole number of things. Uh, but actually, given the state of affairs, you know, it's quoted, there's a letter in this month's uh, Socialist Review that quotes what Lenin said about Zinoviev in 1917. You know, disgraceful man, throw him out of the party, and so on. Fine, what the letter doesn't quote is the fact that within a couple of years, Zinoviev was uh, head of the Petrograd Party uh, organization and president of the Communist International. And this is a fact that Cliff, in his biography of Lenin, points to one of the enormous weaknesses of the Russian Revolution, both inside Russia and in the coming term, was precisely the lack of cadre, the lack of qualified, competent revolutionaries uh, able to take leading roles. That's why somebody like Vela Kahn, who'd actually screwed up the Hungarian Revolution in 1919, is sent to Germany in 1921 to screw up the German Revolution. You know, because, you know, not because uh, um, somebody was soft on Vela Kahn, there wasn't anybody else. There were an awful lot of jobs uh, needed to be done and very few competent people able to do them. That was one of the great weaknesses of the coming term. And of course, uh, I'll try and end on a positive note. That is one of the most fundamental lessons, you know, that uh, the, more, the more socialists there are, the more active, trained, educated, uh, competent socialists there are before a revolutionary crisis, the better chance we have of getting through it. Other comments? Can you hear me? Yeah.
Uh, my name is Ben Lewis uh, from the CPGB. I've also written a book on the Halle Congress that was mentioned briefly uh, uh, by John, where I developed some of my criticisms. Uh, I must say, I kind of, I think, from the general disc discussion, uh, sorry, from the, yeah, okay. from the general discussion, I think I, I that's, well, well I, I tend to agree with John a little bit more, I think, but I would emphasize the, uh, the point that, speak, that both the speakers made. Uh, is that we shouldn't look to take sides in this particular uh, uh, question uh, uh, in, a, in a silly, uh, a historical way. And partly why that is, you can talk about ultra-leftism, where it comes from the weaknesses of, of this or that particular historical person, uh, Levi in question. But if we think about the situation that these people were living through, uh, I think that gives us some indication of, the, of what the, the, the mistakes they made and the context within which they were made. Ultra-leftism in the early KPD, it, it, it's not just with Heidelberg that it comes to the fore, if you look at the founding congress of the KPD, through the skills of Rosa Luxemburg, so they actually avoid the question of whether they'll leave the trade unions. Right? That, that, that's, the ultra leftism is there from the start. That's delayed to a certain extent. So, to this extent, if you look at then Le the way Levi deals with the problem of ultra leftism in Heidelberg, which I think is bungled and wrong to a certain extent, you can nonetheless say it was an intractable problem to a certain extent because, as Levi makes clear, if we are going to stall our work for these people looking to do that kind of uh, ultra-leftist stuff and ignore the mass of the working class, the USPD in particular, which is developing a fierce struggle uh, between the left and the right, then we're done for. And I think that is the enduring legacy of, of Levi, which I think is worth uh, uh, defending. And it relates to the two points around uh, the March action and January 1919. Both of those uh, events, both of those attempts to uh, force a revolution uh, with a minority of the of working class support, run counter to the, one of the basic principles of the KPD's programme established in December uh, 1918, January 1919. And that is, the Spartacus League, as it was called then, as it uh, uh, was set up, will not take governmental power unless we have a majority of support in order to do that. That is what Levi is good for, and that's why the March action in particular was so disastrous. In that sense, it, it is a Bakuninist push. The difference between Marxism and Bakuninism is that we see majority, uh, we see revolution as an act of the self-emancipation of the majority, not a, an enlightened elite that kind of leads the workers by the nose. And I think that's, that is the, it's somewhat uh, uh, exaggerated in Levi's thought, but I think nonetheless it's, uh, it's the, the, the enduring legacy of, of, of Levi. Now Radek, in rather than one of his snotty polemics with Levi, after recalling the posh, you know, aloof uh, intellectual, says, oh, Levi wants us to get 51% of the parliamentary vote before we can have a revolution, and that's not the case at all. It's can you actually enact your program? Do you have enough support to actually say we can come to power and do the kind of things that we, we want to do? And the, the real tragedy of say 1923 is so yeah, we're, we're not for these two major mistakes. January 1919, where loads of Luxembourg turns around to Carl Union, is that our program, Carl? No, and, and, uh, and the March action in 1921. In 1923, the German Communist Party could have been in a position with the majority of the working class behind it to take power. That's, I think, the enduring lesson of, of Levi for us all today, whatever side of the debate you're on. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, ultra leftism was absolutely inevitable in the German situation at that time. Think about it. The SPD had trampled on every vestige of the idea of internationalism and had backed the First World War and had created the conditions for the mass murder of workers across Europe. Uh, it was absolutely inconceivable that people couldn't be outraged by all that filth of reformism as they saw it. Uh, and this was even before the murder of uh, Luxembourg and Liefling. It's absolutely never. And furthermore, uh, the Russian Revolution as they saw it was a fresh page from all that filth. So it was inevitable there was ultra-leftism. Uh, but there was an unresolved question, I think, right from the start of the German Communist Party, which was about whether it was possible for an enlightened elite to lead the working class to revolution without having gone through that long process of winning over working class people. And that's unresolved, I think, even at the 1918 conference, where if you read the speeches of, uh, uh, of the leadership of the party, they actually don't put the position very hard around the question of parliamentary elections. I mean, you know, there's two different ways of making speeches at debates of that sort. You can put a hard position and say, this is what we need to do, or you can do what the leadership did, which said, I'm putting forward a position, but I know you don't agree with me. 
and I accept that you don't agree with me and you don't agree with me because you're wonderful people. And that's really what the leadership said in that debate, it seems to me. Um, I was surprised how softly they put the position uh, at the first Congress. And I think it goes on from that position. Uh, one of the, well, neither speaker mentioned it, one of the opportunities, I think, to win a broader understanding was the response to the cap push of 1920. Uh, at the cap push, cap was a, a general who attempted to drown the German workers' movement uh, with a military rising. It was met by a spontaneous general strike backed by all the major trade unions. Millions of workers took action. The German Communist Party, I don't think, theorised at all from the potential around the cap push to how you could work with much broader layers of worker uh, around that question. And indeed, Levy is then pushed aside from the leadership in the October of 1920, which is why uh, they were able to launch the march action with him pushed, pushed, pushed to the side. Why? Because of his passivity, because of his failure to come up with a sharp movement onto the offensive. In other words, I think one of the problems was that inside the leadership of the German Communist Party, there wasn't a, a, a long polemic from 1918 onwards about the necessity to win working class people over to the side of the revolutionaries. And of course it was hugely tempting to ignore that. I mean, come on, even in 1918, they could call demonstrations of tens and hundreds of thousands of people on the basis of their own call. And not just ordinary demonstrations, armed demonstrations. It must have been quite tempting to think that you didn't have to bother go through all the stuff of parliamentary elections and trade unions and slowly winning, winning over people. But I'm sorry, there's no alternative to doing that. There's no alternative to winning people over to a revolutionary program by patient operation, even in the middle of such a situation as existed in Germany of 1918 and 1919. And that, I think, was the real missed opportunity. Because, of course, then in 1921, this happens, and then, then there's a debate about that. For what it's worth, I don't think there was a cover-up, because I think Lenin was right. We've won the position on the United Front. Now the point is to implement the position of the United Front. Now, is it true that you can't then implement the position without having a sharp polemic against those who haven't followed it from the start? That's an argument, and I'm not going to go into that. Revolutionary leadership is a, is a difficult question. Um, and, but but I'll, I'll, f I'll finish on another point, which I think is important in this. In all of these discussions, what they really lacked was time and respect for a layer of people inside the leadership uh, who could win over the party as a whole. And the reason for that was because the party was built so late. You know, that's the essential difference with the Bolsheviks, isn't it? That the Bolsheviks had for years steel decatur in an argument about how to move forward as revolutionary socialists and the Germans hadn't and because they'd remained inside the SPD for entirely understandable reasons it meant that when the revolutionary crisis came it was far too concentrated it came far too quickly for people and that is an important lesson about the building of revolutionary forces before a crisis There's nobody else <laughs> Uh, you know, again, to the question of ultra-leftism, and I, I think uh, we often can misunderstand what that meant in the general context, as, um, as, as several speakers have said. Um, when you actually look only at the death of uh, Luxembourg and Leibniz, but that was quite rapidly followed by either the death through stress and ill health of several other leaders of the Communist Party, and then the execution and murder of uh, another whole layer of, um, uh, of, of the comrades, up and down the whole of, of Germany. Uh, so the, the idea, you know, then that you'd be against parliamentarianism and, and so on, was not one that, occurred, that, that comes, you know, just for, it was not an abstract idea, there were real concrete things to it. And of course, the thing is that the, the possibilities of the, the, the cap uh, Pooch, um, when uh, workers did rise uh, against uh, uh, and um, get rid of the attempted military takeover, but you know th there was a compromise in the end, which perhaps there was an opportunity there 
for the for the, the for the for the for the revolution and the councils to take over. Um, Men actually that that was the beginning of um, you know of, of the counter of counter revolution where you know the risings in the Ruhr and so on which were you know where the, the military was sent in the the fly corps was begin to be uh, organised and you know again there was wholesale slaughter uh, you know of uh, industrial militants and communists throughout the, the whole of, of Germany so the. The idea that you were going to split off from the SPD, that you were, you know, the later policy of calling them social fascists and so on, actually rose not from you know, any abstractions, but from the real mother and the real dead of hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, German workers. And as Charlie mentioned, um, the uh, when you're a party, so imagine we could call a demonstration of 20, 30, 40, 50,000 workers on, on the streets of London just uh, by ourselves. The, the idea then that you uh, could go much further obviously becomes a very, very real. But the real lesson I think of, if you read Bray's book uh, and so on, it's always, always, always um, the, the opportunity was missed to unite with the great mass of, of the rest of the working class, whether earlier on in the SPD or later on in the, the, the USPD. But all the time, you know, that w was there. It was the question of how they, they applied the tactics of the United Front. And it seemed seems to me, I remember reading when I was much, much younger, Harman's book on the Lost Revolution, uh, I, it was made me quite depressed because, you know, the leadership went the wrong way every bloody time, really. Uh, um, but you have to, we have to understand how that arises out of real social situation. Um, the subject of uh, the uh, German Revolution, of course, um, Karl Marx himself was a German citizen or a citizen of one of the many principalities that existed uh, before 1871. Um, and sometimes um, people are asking, what is your favourite Marxist quote? And I say, um, I wouldn't want to be a member of a club that would have me. And I turned around and I said, yes, that's um, Grant Show, not Carl, but yes, OK. <laughs> um, but that is uh, kind of where it's at, because in a certain manner, um, the revolution happened in a country that couldn't really sustain it in, in the form of Russia, a, a nation of 150 million people where there were three and a half million urban um, factory and workers and miners and so on. Um, and the, the place where it should have happened was Germany and the fact that it didn't happen in, in Germany in the period, in this period, 18 to 23, is um, probably the greatest tragedy that has uh, befallen history. Um, and, and I would add to that that it, it is possible that um, uh, if, if, if um, Germany had succumbed to revolution then well, certainly the atrocities of Stalin would, would never have been um, and uh, that uh, and of course neither would the uh, atrocities of the Nazis either, because they would have been blocked out by by the by, by the course of the revolution occurring in a left manner at the time. Okay. Um, when I first joined the Social Workers Party, um, I think it was only about a few months. Um, do, do people been around long enough to remember Sunday afternoon educationals? Yeah, sorry, it's a long time ago. Uh, basically that was about kind of 20 at the time, which is a few years ago. And um, I was uh, told by uh, a couple of older comrades, could you do, as we want to do an educational on um, left-wing communism, ultra-leftism, and I was given two books. I was given Chris Harman's um, Lost Revolution 
and I was given uh, Lenin's uh, left wing communism. And reading Chris Harmon, I mean, I mean, it's worth a reread now. Reading it is, I mean, it, it, the way he wrote was very much you kind of it immersed you in in the in, in the revolution. But also there was a there was a kind of a, a couple of kind of quotes in there like um, I can't remember one of the speakers will be able to tell me who, who said it, but uh, we're all dead men on leave. Remember that quote? We're all dead men on leave. Okay. And I just thought. What the fuck have I joined? <laughs> <laughs> what have I got myself in But incredibly inspiring, but also just incredibly uh, depressing. And in terms of kind of today, when you're kind of watching those processes in Egypt, in turn, you know, the, and particularly the, the, the phase has gone in, in, into in, in Egypt. And there's always that thing when I'm kind of reminded of what's happened at home in terms of have they gone too early? <laughs> It's that one, isn't it? But we're very lucky, aren't we, that we've got, you know, comrades like Alan Alexander, um, the comrades, the Revolutionary Socialists, the, the reports and so on, and every time, and my, my heart always kind of is lifted when I know that the Mahala textile workers, uh, there's a kind of rising there, and I think, I feel a bit more confident then, uh, and particularly in the, in the last thing, and of course it does come back very finally, doesn't it? And I think, you know, that's why I think we do need a united party, a united socialist workers party uh, that uh, can uh, actually, I mean we learn don't we from the revolutions that have taken place but you know people learn from us as well. There's an African comrade apparently that said the other day that he said if we had a fraction, just a fraction of the membership of the socialist workers party so much we could intervene in. I'll just leave it on that, thanks. This group, uh, at Hamlet's branch. Um, I had to do a branch meeting. I think it, actually at Hannah's branch the other day on, on the United um, on the United Front, which made me look back and read a little bit about this period. And um, I agree completely with with Charlie that um, part of the problem was was the split. Uh, you know, at, with communists peeling away um, from social democrats and being disgusted at how they have been let down in the past. And it made me think when I was listening to uh, the meeting that John Monaghan gave on the five principles of the international socialist tendency, that the one principle that I didn't think he gave enough emphasis to was how our tendency has learned and developed the tradition of the United Front. And I think that is a key part of our tradition because it teaches us all how we can use uh, the the fight around what is how we how we pull a retreat, uh, and through a retreat, turn that retreat into a, a victory through the successful application of the United Front. So although I can't remember, uh, it's a while since I've read about the um, the, the period uh, in detail of, uh, of that those years uh, in 1918-19, and all these different debates that were going on between um, between uh, the these um, what what. Uh, uh, I think uh, George Galloway talked about why do we keep on talking about red, dead Russians, but I think it's very important that we do keep talking about dead Russians. But these debates, I think, are terribly important to informing us as to how we apply the theory of the United Front today and don't fall into the mistakes uh, that were made. Because I think one of the, the quotes that I remember coming out of um, uh, my reading was a German comrade from this period described uh, the United Front saying that the road of a united front is like a mountain path. It's very narrow and it's very slippery and it's easy to fall off on either side. And I think, uh, you know, sometimes we shouldn't be afraid when we get it a bit wrong, but I think we do stand in that tradition of learning the successful application of the united front and that's what informs our tendency. I think one of the slight problems is this is the debate form we're having tonight because it sounds a bit like as if we have to it's Levi for or against and I think that missing is really the dynamic because it's so close to the twigs on the bloody tree we're not seeing the forest really and I think that's a problem you see to discuss um, discuss the march action without understanding its relation back to the cat push and the fact that really what the impression you get throughout this period 
is that the German Communist Party is just buffeted by forces and it's always kind of too late. The thing about the cat putsch is that the Communist Party didn't react quick enough at all. It wasn't, it was behind the curve when it came to the general strike that was being called. It didn't think it was very important. Um, and having sort of been too late then, when it came to the march, actually it was too soon. In other words, what it lacked, I think this is the point that Charlie King was making, was that close, continuous attention to a debate and argument to steal the, the cadence, steal the, the Communist Party, all the people in it, to understand what was required at any one particular point. And I think that's really the issue, much more than whether, you know, Paul Levy was particularly nasty to this and the other. I think it's much more a question of the kind of real issues. And the common turn in that sense is always kind of running to try and catch up at one point to make sure that the best experience is there. Has to sacrifice, I mean, Lenin says, Levi at least had a head to lose, but nevertheless, wrongly in terms of not being anybody else to, to, to learn from it. And that's in a sense the problem for the Communist Party in Germany, in that sense. Without being able to absorb the kind of lessons of having built the party in advance that comes from the Russian experience. And that I think is the key thing, because in, you know, in Russia you had similar kind of problems of toing and fraying, but able to be able to intervene was absolutely crucial. You don't get that sense, and that's the real tragedy, of the ability of the German communists to be able to and to be able to relate to the movements, to relate to the ups and downs in such a way, always to be able to strengthen their forces, to be able to act in a way that would have made German the October Revolution of 1923 an actuality instead of a miss, another missed opportunity with all the consequences that went from that. So step back, back as well and look at the bigger picture, because I think What's so important about this period, obviously it's clearly massively frustrating, as a comrade earlier said, that the Communist Party seems to make every possible mistake going, and the leadership from each previous mistake makes the opposite error, compounding the first one. Yeah, and, but, I, but, I think, but I think if you look at, I think there's lots of positives about it, in the sense that this is a, you know, this is a revolution happening an advanced industrial country where the majority of the population are, 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 are workers, where there's a mass reformist party, there's a mass trade union movement and a trade union bureaucracy, but at the same time it's possible to build a mass revolutionary party which at its peak has around half a million members. And I think that's what, why this period is so enormously important. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the lessons we, we, we're drawing are, are, are negative ones, but I think there, were, there was plenty in the situation that showed that things could have been different. I mean, it, in the cat putsch, it's true that the, the KPD uh, abstained initially. They, you know, they, they, didn't, they didn't see the need to, to, to defend the Weimar Republic against, against the, the military in the far right. But when they did get it right, like in, in, the, um, in central Germany, around Saxony, when they did work together with other workers, the, the, there was a situation of dual power, to power developed and, there was, and it showed the real possibility of turning what was a defensive struggle against the military coup into, into a, a positive bid for power as, as exactly what happened in Russia in the, in the, following the, the Kornilov coup. So I think there's loads of, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a historical tragedy as a previous comrade said because had the, you know, had the communists taken power in October 1923 there would have been no Stalinism there'd be no Hitler, no World War II, and, and no Holocaust. So what we're talking about is a struggle of you know, world historic proportions. But I think for us today, it, it's full of, of lessons for us. Uh, and I think we, we really need to, I think it's important that people understand this period. It shows the enormous possibilities and also how it's possible to, to screw up even the most friendly, favorable situation. Um, I just want to ask a question about a different aspect of, of this discussion. Um, I, I remember seeing uh, Ian and uh, John both contribute to a debate a couple of years ago, uh, Historical Materialism, uh, uh, the book launch for the Paul Levy book, I can't remember the name of the editor. Fernback. Fernback. David Fernback. David Fernback. Um, and my memory's a bit hazy of the discussion, but as I, as I recall it, uh, one of the one aspect of the discussion was that Fernback seemed quite keen to concentrate on the baleful, baleful influence of the Leninist Comintern 
Um, and so we put a lot of emphasis on that dimension of the reasons for the failure of the German Communist Party. And the implications seem to be that uh, a Luxembourgist party might be therefore preferable. Um, I might have that wrong. Um, but, but coming out of that, I think uh, a, a more general question comes up about the way in which we look at the history of the Communist parties, um, which is that there are explanations which tend to, tend to focus on the, um, the, the nationally driven element of the decisions by the local leaderships and other explanations which tend to focus on them being totally controlled from, from Moscow. Um, so I just wondered if either speaker would like to come back on, 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 on that and uh, at what point do you think that you know, Moscow's influence did become uh, decisive? I, I was going to ask a question going in a similar direction, which is what the possibilities at the time that are open for the common term. Uh, we're talking about a situation where we said of absolute world historic importance, particularly for the left at the time. Something which wasn't was important not just for uh, Germany, but for the development of the left in the whole of the world, where the German party, German uh, Communist Party, was very weak, having had a number of its um, intellectual cadre assassinated, and, um, and not really having, having, having the, um, the required um, depth or, um, or, or size, leading them, as was said, to make a um, number of uh, mistakes and going too early to late events. You had, at the time, an international uh, communist movement, particularly in Russia, Although in Russia they were a little bit uh, involved with themselves, so a little matter of civil war and famine and trying to build socialism and things like that, where um, Germany was it, it, so it, 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 it absolutely important and another thing on the list of other things. And whereas uh, in the rest of the, um, uh, the, the rest of the West and, and, and the rest of the world, uh, the communists had suffered defeat in Hungary and things like that. So it seems like when people have been talking about the, the people from the Comintern involved of Bela Kuhn, of Radek, of Zinoviev, it's not necessarily the um, strategic cadre who are getting involved here. And the question of, was the, given the situation, given the, given the defeats that have been had, and given that the Russians were very busy, would it have been possible for the common to to, uh, to to provide a, a more um, a, a more interventionist role, or was it given the situation of the left in Germany? Was it really um, if the, if what happened? What happened was going to happen? What what could have the common turn done differently that, uh, that it didn't do? Okay, there are no more hands, so I think Ian and uh, John would appreciate a few more minutes each to sum up. So I'm going to give them nine minutes each to sum up. I'm going to start with Ian. Right, thanks very much. Um, I thought that was a very interesting and useful discussion. Um, a number of points I mean, accept. Uh, you know, that, that I didn't mention the camp push, yes, fine. Uh, the importance of the camp push and the fact that uh, the German Communist Party was get, getting it wrong is absolutely essential. Even more important, I think, is the argument about 1923. Um, I think that the March action was one of the crucial factors that led to the failure of uh, 1923. You know, you look at what was going on, and uh, have a look at the book by Victor Serge that I translated that was mentioned earlier. You know, the situation on the streets, the mass inflation, the presence of the French army on German soil, the complete collapse of the economy, the fact that, as Serge points out, you know, uh, it was so, there was no heating in people's homes because they couldn't afford it, so they went out onto the streets at night. And of course they argued, they argued politics, and there were Nazis on the street, there were communists on the street. And so of course the whole streets turned into a massive debate between communists and, uh, and Nazis. Um, and of course in this part, you know, there was the enormous possibility that uh, you could have had the breakthrough. And one of the real problems was that many, many social democratic workers who would have been sympathetic to a, to a bid for power, said, 
Ah yes, but those subs in the Communist Party, look at the way they screwed up two years ago. You can't trust the bastards. And that, I think, was one of the crucial factors that led to the failure. Now, the whole question about the Comintern and the, uh, uh, and the national sections is a very complex one. You know, I think the, there, there is a Trotskyist mythology that uh, the first five years were splendid, everything went right in the first five years because Lenin and Trotsky were there, and then after the first five years suddenly everything went wrong. Uh, and it's much more complicated uh, than that. Uh, there were all sorts of things going wrong from the beginning, and as people have quite rightly said, one of the things going wrong was Zinoviev. Um, you know, and there's some very interesting letters um, at least one of which is in English, and more of which I hope will soon be in English, uh, from, uh, from Clara Zetkin to Lenin, you know, complaining about the way that the Comintern apparatus is operating. She was uh, both at the founding conference of the French Communist Party and the Congress of the Italian Party a couple of months later, where there was the, um, uh, the split in the wrong way. Uh, you know, and Zetkin is very upset, by the way, that uh, often the very second-rate apparatchiks being sent from Moscow, you know, and as somebody pointed out, uh, because actually the, the best people were all far too busy fighting the Civil War. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the situation was that the Comintern often was unhelpful. At the same time, I think we have to say that often you know, the, the, there is also the liberal myth that, of course, well, the Comintern was imposing policies on these local sections and they should have all been left total autonomy. Um, you know, the, the famous 21 conditions for affiliation. Now, if you read the 21 conditions, um, actually about 15 of them are about uh, fairly minor organisational uh, matters that uh, don't matter too much one way or the other. But about five or six of them actually set out, and I think, you know, many of them are still very relevant today, what should a revolutionary party be doing? It should be fighting through parliament, fighting through the trade unions, organising uh, intransigently against imperialism, working to subvert the army, and so on. Those conditions are valid, and actually there were lots and lots of opportunists who'd come into the Comintern who weren't happy with those at all. And they, so the influence of the Comintern often uh, was, very, uh, was very positive. Now, Comrade mentioned uh, uh, David Fernbach, uh, who has uh, produced this volume of writings of, uh, of Paul Levy. Um, and as, you know, I think first of all we have to say we owe a great debt to, uh, to David Fernbach. Um, you know, for all too long, uh, our understanding of the history of the common term uh, has been far too much, you know, well there was Lenin and there was Trotsky and then there were the masses, you know, and there are actually a whole number of other people who were very important, um, like, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, uh, like Levy, uh, like Zinoviev, um, who we still uh, don't know nearly enough, um, you know, and uh, the, the fact that Fernbach has given us this additional information about Levy and translated his writing is greatly to be welcomed. I think, however, that he is absolutely wrong to try and identify, first of all, something called the Luxembourgish tradition. Rosa Luxemburg was a wonderful person, a great revolutionary. I don't believe there is a coherent body of uh, political thought that you can call Luxembourgism. Um, and which, and particularly, which you can juxtapose to Leninism. Uh, you know, I think things are rather more complicated and rather more fluid uh, than a juxtaposition like that. So I don't think that uh, this particular account uh, of Levy as the heir of Luxembourg uh, is quite right. And uh, I mean, uh, I can find this. Yeah. Um, it's worth uh, noting what uh, Luxembourg said before she died about the ultra-lefts in the party. The Spartacists are a fresh generation, free from the cretinous traditions of the good old party. That's the SPD. We decided unanimously not to make the matter of the boycott into a cardinal question and not to take it too seriously. 
You know, so actually Luxembourg's position uh, on the ultra lefts is very different from what Levy's position was at Frankenberg. Um, and finally, I just want to uh, reiterate something I, I was saying earlier. You know, uh, there's no point sort of, uh, you know, looking, taking, taking sides in these uh, quarrels and saying, ah, oh, that's, that's our man or that's our woman. But actually, Having looked at this uh, period a certain amount, you know, I don't think, uh, this is a difference of emphasis with John, I don't think Levy comes out of it terribly well. I think the person in the German Communist Party who comes out best is Clara Zetkin. And actually Clara Zetkin, uh, although she's known, is known mainly for her work on the, uh, the so-called woman question. Zetkin's work was much broader, much more significant than simply the work on the, the oppression of women. Uh, and if I can end with a uh, commercial plug, I hope within the next year the journal Revolutionary History will be producing uh, an extensive collection of the hitherto untranslated uh, works of Clara Zetkin. And I think that will be another contribution, like Fernbach's, to our understanding of this enormously important period. Yes, I want to very much agree with Gareth Jenkins, who spoke about um, whether this debate format is the most useful way of getting across the sorts of arguments and ideas that we need to get across. I do agree with that. Actually. I, th I think perhaps it was a mistake to do it like this, because there's much more agreement between Ian and I than contemporaries. It's, it's a really complicated subject. I mean, each of these events that build up towards the failure of the German Revolution do need to be analysed in some sort of detail. It wasn't really available for us tonight. I just want to touch on two of them. The question of um, whether the, and I just by the way, just mentioning, just, just, just another point about Gareth, I wanted to say before, um, Gareth is translating Brouet's History of the Common Turn, and you may, have, you may not know, you may have forgotten, and it's in one of the ISJs that the chair referred to, 136, I quote Gareth, which is a conversation, an email conversation I had with him, where he, he summarises what, what he thinks the theory of the offensive is. I don't want to read it out now, you can read it for yourselves. But it's a particularly succinct summary of the theory of the offensive about which we don't really know enough. And this, this leads me on to the whole question of whether the common term was, was over-Leninist and therefore getting things wrong. That phrase strikes me as someone wanting to say, had it already become Stalinist? I don't think that's the issue at all. The really interesting thing for me about the theory of the offensive is that it reflects the inconsistency of the common term as a kind of crude rule of thumb when Lenin was involved, the common term normally got it right, because the sensitivity of the man is quite extraordinary. From kind of, to, to be able to move from kind of ruthlessness and all history to kind of extreme sensitivity. I mean, on the one hand, it could be sensitivity, sensitive to the old dress, but he was also extremely sensitive about Levy. He did not want Levy thrown out. He wanted to find a route back for Levy because he recognised his talents and so on. But when Lenin wasn't involved, when the, when, the, when the theory of the offensive kind of guys were involved, it was a disaster. I just want to emphasise what a disaster it was. I want to repeat, it wasn't just a march action, it was the split of the Italian Socialist Party that led to an absolutely diabolical version of how the Italian Communist Party started with, with, with Bordiga, which is extreme ultra-left, far too small, which misunderstood the rise of Mussolini. That was a direct result of the intervention of that bit of the common turn, where Lenin and Trotsky in the centre of the Arthur Hall were leading to the theories of the, of, of the, of the, of the theory of the offensive. The theories of the offensive. And I want to suggest one reason for this, which I haven't really touched on at all, is just how difficult, how tough were the conditions in Russia. I mean, they'd been through the Civil War. After the Civil War, there was in Kronstadt, an, an NEP, a massive switch, the switch to NEP, which is very early on. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's a coincidence that it's the very same time the theory of the offensive is very, very dominant. Because the NEP signalled some kind of sense of the Russian Revolution failure. Not to say it had already failed, but the NEP was a massive switch, and Lenin many times becomes more and more nervous about what the implications of the NEP are. And, and you, you have the, and the, again, it doesn't need further researching, but you have the feeling that the theory of the offensive about a, a kind of desperate attempt, let's hurry things up, let's hurry things up, let's get the revolution started in the rest of Europe, otherwise it's all going to fail. That, but that, that does need uh, a further uh, exploration. That's the first point I want to make. I want to make two points. The second point is, I think Ian and I both made a mistake not to mention the cap butch. I want to refer to it in a slightly different way. I have a, it, may, it may well be not everyone knows about it, and why should you? But what's interesting about the cap butch, it's, it shows you this, the continuing strength of German militarism 
despite the fact they'd been defeated, very close to the end of the war. It was an attempt, essentially, by doing militarism, to, to, to get rid of the parliament, I repeat, get rid of the parliament, and insert some form of military rule. And so that's the point I made at the very beginning. The victory of the SPD in January 19 made decisive the authority of parliament. And it's something the German Communist Party consistently failed to fully understand. In other words, Levy was actually in prison at the time when the cat putsch occurred. Who, what were the forces? The working class did intervene. The working class intervened with the general strike, not led by the Communist Party, led by those self-centred social democrats. A degree of consistency about the importance of parliament. And what this raises is the importance of the Revolutionary Party being really flexible. On the one hand, the capacity to lead massive street demonstrations when it's appropriate, but also knowing when to retreat, but also the importance of intervening in parliamentary elections. And I just want to, us to reflect on this in the here and now. So in other words, take the, the example in Egypt. The, the, this extraordinary people power demonstration, almost the like of which you've never seen before. And it's kind of this peculiar short-term outcome which has all these dangers in it. And at some point, uh, the, 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 the Egyptian army, which effectively controls events at the moment, nevertheless has this kind of shadow of the possible revival of the People Power Street movement and all the workers' strikes that's accompanied it, has, is going to have to concede some kind of presidential and parliamentary elections. It's going to be absolutely essential that the beginnings of the, of the revolutionary socialist organisation in Egypt takes terribly seriously, takes terribly seriously uh, those parliamentary elections, that uses them to find a voice to articulate not just a revolutionary socialist message, but hopefully actually get some of those uh, uh, street strugglers and, and, and workers strikers represented into that parliament to give, both to give voice to the socialist message, but also, as it were, to use both Lenin and Luxembourg's formulation from 1919 to undermine the parliament from within. Because whether we like it or not, I'll end on this note, what we've been talking about, I don't think we've laid enough emphasis on it, is that, think about it, we haven't seen a successful socialist revolution in an advanced industrial country. We haven't seen a successful mass-based revolutionary socialist party in an advanced industrial country. That's why this kind of meeting is terribly important, lessons we have to learn. And in the 21st century, there are further problems that we have to address. So flexibility and intelligence in the beginnings of the Revolutionary Party, whether it's here in Egypt or in Germany, elsewhere, is incredibly important. And we can, we, the lessons, some of the lessons we can learn from, 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 from studying the German Revolution do allow us to apply to new situations that occur today. Thank you.